I am so glad you convinced me that the family car should be the Defender 110. It is so beautiful inside. It's so comfortable, and it just feels indestructible. Yes, it really is. I've been waiting a long time for the new model to come out. The Defender 110, I'm telling you, it's my favorite car of all times. It's my third one. You know, I have stories of going off-road. The guy managed the group. He was like, what are you doing in this beautiful car? I'm like, I'm going off-road. He's like, are you sure? Because you can use one of ours. And then they look like Mad Max cars. I'm like, no, 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 we're going to do this. And he was shocked. Wow. Well, it's great because the Defender has been reimagined for 21st century adventure and its unparalleled off-road ability as well as its robust interior are invaluable whether you're headed towards uncharted territory or just a weekend of exploration. The Defender 110 tackles challenging surroundings with absolute confidence. The SUV conveys strength outside and in, featuring peerless technology like an intuitive driver display and an award-winning infotainment system. That's my favorite part, to keep you connected no matter where the journey takes you. Adventure is unique to everyone, and so is the Defender. Choose from the two-door Defender 90, the four-door Defender 110, or the larger Defender 130 with the ability to seat up to eight passengers. You'll find uncompromising performance in all three. So pack up and go even further with the Defender 110. Learn more at LandRoverUSA.com forward slash Defender. These days, we're all investors. Trying to be smart with our money despite our worst impulses. But at iShares, we believe that deep down inside of every investor is a better investor. One that's just waiting to be let out. Explore iShares ETFs and insights and let your best investor out. Visit iShares.com for more information. This isn't your average business podcast, and he's not your average host. This is the James Altucher Show on the Choose Yourself Network. Today on the James Altucher Show. The one thing I noticed is that actors usually bring in one of two things with them into a room. They usually either bring in pig pen which is this character who is preceded and followed by this cloud of dust. And actors sometimes bring that in by saying, um, my aunt died in Philadelphia last night, so I had to take the train down there and I never got a chance to look at your script. And you're out. Why do they do that? Fear, we're afraid. We're afraid of our own shadows. Sometimes we come in and we impose our problems into the room and that's pig pen. And you're dead. That is so interesting because it happens in every situation in life, really. And then every once in a blue moon, people bring in Elvis dust. And Elvis dust is when actors come in and it's this strange combination of self-esteem meets homework, meets right for the part, meets the room. And when people bring in Elvis dust, all we want to do is get it on us. Are you hiring? Do you know where to post your job to find the best candidates? Well, with ZipRecruiter, you can post your job to over 100 of the web's leading job boards with just one click. Unlike other hiring sites, ZipRecruiter doesn't depend on the right candidates finding you. It finds them. Find out today why ZipRecruiter has been used by businesses of all sizes to find the most qualified job candidates with immediate results. And right now, my listeners can post jobs on ZipRecruiter for free. That's right, free. Just go to ZipRecruiter.com slash James. That's ZipRecruiter.com slash James. One more time to try it for free, go to ZipRecruiter.com slash James. With three mattress models, Casper mattresses are perfectly designed to soothe and cradle your natural geometry. Not to mention the breathable design helps you sleep cool and regulates your body temperature throughout the night. And I have to say, I have run into, even in the street, people talking to me about my podcast and telling me they love their Casper mattress. No joke. And it's delivered right to your door in a small, how do they do that size box with free shipping and returns in the U.S. and Canada. But the best part is that you can be sure of your purchase with Casper's 100-night risk-free sleep-on-it trial. 
You spend one third of your life sleeping, so you should be comfortable. Sleeping on a Casper has changed the way I feel in the morning. The best investment is to get better sleep. Start sleeping ahead of the curve with Casper. Get $50 towards any mattress purchase by visiting casper.com slash James and using James at checkout. That's casper.com slash James, offer code James for $50 off your mattress purchase. Terms and conditions apply. I'm so happy to have John McGinley as a guest on the on the podcast. John, most people probably don't recognize your name, I'm going to have to say, but welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff. And you're one of my favorite actors of all time. You've been in so many different shows and movies that I've loved, but the most famous one that people will know is probably you played uh, Dr. Perry Cox in Scrubs for nine seasons. Um uh, again, I, I, I'm, ho- I'm assuming many people, most people have, have watched Scrubs. It's one of the funniest TV shows of all time. You were kind of the, uh, as they say, reluctant mentor of the main character, JD, played by Zach Braff. Um, you've also been in uh, Platoon. You've been in Wall Street. You were, you were the guy sitting right next to Charlie Sheen in Wall Street, always kind of uh, giving your own kind of semi- sarcastic guidance and uh you were in uh many many oliver stone movies uh you started out in theater and you studied acting at nyu so you're a real i I hate to use this phrase too but you're a real actor's actor like that's that was your your roots um i almost don't know where to begin but let's start with acting why did you do it you don't really kind of seem like an actor when i in in many respects i felt Early, early on, uh, that I wanted to be a storyteller. And I didn't know what that looked like other than I, I knew I loved participating in any kind of storytelling process. Well, what about what about writing? And I know you had a, a brief flirtation where you wanted to be a sports journalist. I did. I was writing a lot of copy up at, uh, at Newhouse, up at Syracuse. And all the copy was for upperclassmen. And I just felt like that was completely BS. I was like, if I'm going to write 17 drafts of this 15 second piece, I'm, I'm doing it. And the answer was like, no, you're not. And so it, it was clear. I just wanted to be part of telling this story. And so I transferred down to NYU undergrad. I went to Circle in the Square. And then I, I trans- One Circle in the Square, I'm sorry. Circle, there's five different schools at undergrad acting at NYU. There's uh, Adler, there's Circle in the Square, there's Experimental, and there's two other uh, schools, and they're all separate within the um, underneath the umbrella of the acting undergrad program. And it was okay, but it was too big. And so as a junior, you're allowed to apply to grad school uh, with the understanding that if you get kicked out, of which you're probably going to, because there was a mandatory attrition rate, so they accepted 45 and every year 15 were gone. Oh my gosh. So second year, there was 30 of you, and third year, 15 of you would graduate. Would people cry if they were kicked out? <laughs> yes. But in, in all, in all uh, with all due respect, a lot of my classmates should have, and I love shrinks, should have either been with a shrink or a rabbi or a priest and just been exchanging whatever was torturing them. What, what do you think, what, what, was, what was torturing them? Who knows, abuse, substances. Do, uh, do, do you think actors often I, and I didn't think of this, this before, but you think actors are often tortured because then playing other roles is a way to sort of maybe kind of work through this torture or maybe, be but, someone else maybe, other but than not the person often, tortured? But not often. Here's why. If you're, doing, if you're doing a Broadway or an off-Broadway play and the mantra at NYU grad was eight a week because the production schedule for any off-Broadway play or any Broadway play is eight shows a week. So you two do Saturdays, six, seven days. Six nights, two matinees. Mm-hmm. And so whatever the level of your, your torture or, or your self-loathing, it will not serve an eight show a week schedule. So even if you had the, the inclination to act to sort of escape this, this self-loathing, you still need the work discipline, which requires some uh, self-help rather than self-loathing. <laughs> Correct. And you have to, and what NYU grad became was this technical college of how to preserve your voice for eight a week because you can't lose your voice. It's not possible. Mm. You can't in that in that fight in the second act of Cat on the Hot Tin Roof, you can't hurt your elbow. 
we have to do, we're doing one again tonight and then we're doing two Saturday and one Sunday. I mean, this is what makes theater so, you have so to much get different the than TV acting. Not so much because if we're gonna do 70 takes with some jackass director of, of you falling when you come into the studio, you're gonna, and it's a tight shot on you, so it can't be a, a double. Uh, we have to see James falling when he comes into the studio. And if, if Bob in Video Village is going, no, James, no, do it, I need you to tumble. And unless you know how to do that, you're going to get hurt. And then for the rest of the movie, you will be hurt. And that's gonna be a problem. We may have to recast it. So, 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 so when you say it's like a technical college, tell me some of the skills. So there's, there's obviously there's voice work. And, and by the way, that's interesting to me because you've done a lot of voiceover work for animated shows as well, which I didn't know before researching this podcast, but there's voice work. There's obviously kind of physical acting work that must happen. Like what, what do you study to tumble? I'll tell you what I thought was in retrospect, one of the great classes. And it was first year and it was called circus skills. And the reason circus skills was good is whatever circus skill you landed on, whether it was walking on a tightrope, which was elevated four feet off the ground with, with mats underneath, so in case you fell, nothing, um, or juggling, whatever circus skill that you wanted to focus on in this classroom, any tension you hold will present while you're doing the circus skill. So if you're learning how to juggle and you hold tension in your shoulders, your shoulders will go up around your ears mm. and you'll only be able to juggle for 30 seconds because you'll mm. get so tired. And as soon as they come down and you learn to breathe and you just start juggling like this, that's how you want to go on stage. You don't want to go, because when your tension is really manifesting, right when you're in the wings before you're about to go on, your shoulders will be up around your ears unless you learn how to breathe and make your instrument long and wide and available. That's so interesting because there's so many areas of life where I know I get nervous where people always say, just relax your shoulders. It seems like that's the first thing you have to relax in almost every tense situation. Or some actor's knees lock up. <laughs> well, you can't walk on stage with locked up knees. So what are we gonna do about that? And so we'll explore breath and we'll explore managing uh, where relaxation is, how that works for you where, where, how we can get James's, maybe James's elbows are locking up and how can we get him to, to free those up? So that when you walk on stage eight times a week, you're, this, this, you're not walking on like robot man, because you can't, it's too expensive. It has, and, and there has of, to be re relaxation. Is a lot of this about learning to be your normal self in these artificial situations. So, and by artificial, I mean, when you're on the theater, on the stage playing somebody else, you still have to be human. I don't know if it's about applying or, or aspiring to be your normal self, since as we've established, some people's normal self is a train wreck. Mm -hmm. And that, that, that transformation into playing Steve uh, is liberating and that that's where the relaxation is. Because when your your normal self is this collection of damaged eccentricities that somehow can, can all of a sudden solidify into playing a character, if you have the technical know-how. You know, it, it's so interesting, you know, and again, it, you say technical college, technical know-how. I think at a very base level, a lot of people think acting is, oh, here's a script, I'm gonna memorize the lines, I'm gonna try to, act as, as much as possible how this person would, would, would act and they go out there and do it. But there's so many sub skills that need to be learned, not to mention the psychology of auditioning and getting the role. I, I saw one interview and we'll, we'll, we're gonna skip around a little bit, I hope you don't mind, but I saw one um, interview you did where you thrive off of other people's nerves when they're auditioning. So you see them coming out like in pain out of an audition and you start thinking more and more, I'm gonna get this part. And specifically you described that for the scrubs part. I did. Uh, so when you, it's called going to network. Once you've made it through four or five levels of auditions for a TV show, uh, you go to the final audition and it's called going to network. And so you're usually on campus at one of the big networks, whether whether it's you're at Universal or you're at Warner Brothers or you're at Paramount, but it, it's high stakes poker. And before you go into audition, um, five stacks of script of, of contracts that you agreed to last night with your lawyer are there. And so you sign them and they're for five years. 
and that's what you sign. So you know what the upside is before you go in. And like most broke ass actors. And, and not only upside, but also you've committed mentally to five years of your life. It doesn't matter. All that matters is financially for most broke ass actors, you're about to make $32,000 a week for 22 weeks for the next five years. That's unimaginable. And those are baseline numbers. They, they, they all go up. Right. And so you, you must get like uh, residuals or when it, when the show keeps airing on sure. Comedy Central. I'm just making up the 32, yeah. but whatever it is, it's some unimaginable number that yeah. you didn't make a year as a waiter mm. uh, of which all of us were. And so you sign those and then you wait. And there's usually about five or six variations on a theme of you. So there might be a Latin John McGinley, there might be a black John McGinley, uh, there might be another John McGinley and another John McGinley. So there's six of us. In other words, I've gone to many auditions where Ving Rhames and I were uh, auditioning for the same thing. That's what I mean. There's different flavors in the final. And so when you're sitting there uh, going to network and people start coming out who've gone in before you and I see that they're dear in headlights, it calms me because I know I'm not doing that. I know what I am going to do and I know what I'm not going to do. I'm not, your terror calms me and it's very liberating. I want to get that feeling. So wh why does their terror? So, so I get it that, okay, they played a part. They played a version of the part that you know you're not going to do because you're going to be you in that part. So on on the one hand, you could say, okay, they didn't check the box, which gives me a higher probability of checking the box. But you're specifically also referring to their terror. Yes, that human that human condition that I'm seeing you coming out of that audition room, of which there's probably thirty people from the network sitting on the floor, sitting on on the the next to the windows. It's it looks fake. It's like summer stock. And there's a couple of chairs for you at the other side of the room and there'll be a reader with you. And they, they say, okay, let's play the scene. And the room is either crickets or it's dying and you got them right here. Mm -hmm. And when you got them here, you have a pretty good shot. You're going to get it. And when I walked out of that Scrubs interview, of which uh, audition, of which Bill Lawrence who wrote Scrubs in the margin when Dr. Cox is first shows up, he wrote uh, a John McGinley type. So you were you had high confidence from that? No, they no. made me audition five times. <laughs> and, and well, okay, and for I wanna, a John McGinley type. And and I want to get to the actual initial audition. But what do, what are the network executives? What are they look? Who are they? Like what are they looking for? Are they qualified? Well, not Jeff, to not to put them down or anything. Like they're doing their jobs. I've had very good experiences with network exec Jeff Zucker, who was really championed me. Um, in a bunch of different Emmy campaigns and was very supportive of me. He was in the room and he was now runs CNN. He was the head of NBC and he was a super powerful guy. And he uh, greenlit me playing Dr. Cox. There are a lot of people who put their metaphorical soups, spoons in the soup in TV. There's a lot of voices. Unlike if you go into audition for Oliver, Oliver Stone, there's one voice, it's Oliver's. In TV, unless it's Shonda Rhimes or some huge, uh, powerful TV person, I don't know who that is, but uh, it you got to go through a bunch of different layers. Like Disney was the producer for NBC, so I had to I had to audition two or three times at Disney, and then that crop of actors was brought to NBC. I auditioned once at NBC, and then I went to I auditioned five times. Five times, and so Bill, what did Bill Lawrence see in you, the creator of Scrubs? What did he see in you that he wanted you to play this role? Now, I, I don't know. I, well, I mean, clearly, it seems like you could play this role of damaged character with a heart of gold somewhere underneath that maybe you only rarely see, but you 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 do that role well. Uh, did, was he looking specifically for that or did you convince him to look for that? I don't know, but actors have, I was the reader for Oliver Stone for three or four films, The Doors, um, Nixon. What does it mean reader? So when actors come in an audition, uh, there's someone in the room who's going to read the scene with them. Uh, they know their lines and someone's going to read the, and so you, readers can make or break you. And I love actors. So you wanted me to be your reader. Mm. 
And the one thing I noticed uh, when I was reading, when I was the reader, when you came in to meet with Oliver, is that actors usually bring in one of two things with them into a room. Uh, they usually either bring in Pigpen, which in Peanuts, in Charlie Brown, is this character who is preceded and followed by this cloud of dust, of shit. And actors sometimes bring that in and they subvert themselves by, by saying, um, I, my, my aunt died in Philadelphia last night, so I had to take the train down there and I never got a chance to look at your script. Mm. You're out. You just lost Oliver. He just fogged over. And then every once in a blue moon, and I've had it twice that I can tell you, people bring in Elvis dust. And Elvis dust is when actors come in and it's this strange combination of self-esteem meets homework, meets right for the part, meets the room. And when people bring in Elvis dust, I call it Elvis dust because when someone brings in Elvis dust, oh, no, right, all down. we want to do is get it on us. Even if you came into audition, if you McGinley came into audition for the Latin cop, uh, but you brought in this stuff, the Latin cop's not Latin cop anymore. He's an Irish mule and you're in the movie. Well, you have to be in the movie. Well, well, that's interesting because it's related to something else you've said in an interview. The only thing about Elvis dust that you don't want to get confused with is if you try to manufacture it, it comes off as arrogance. And there's nothing more polarizing than arrogance because directors and writers sprinkle fear on their cereal in the morning and arrogance makes them go cower. And so Elvis dust is not to be confused with arrogance. So wait, there's, there's so much to unpack here. So, so uh, the- And I watched it. I watched people come in. 200 actors reading for uh, talk radio, reading for uh, Nixon, reading for The Doors. And I watched them come in and I watched how Oliver affected them. And I watched what you did. What? And I'm looking at them like, no, no. Oh, you blew it. So, so tell, tell me a specific example. You don't have to name the name, but like tell me an actor who came in for like, to play Jim Morrison, and there was just a look. Who's who's an who's an well, arrogant no, Val was, guy? Val was always Jim, but people would come in and they would just look Oliver right in the eye, and they'd go, "I don't read." And I was like, "Well, you you have to read. That's what we're doing." And they're like, "I don't read. Reading mean I don't audition." And I'm like, "You had the part. All you had to do was open your mouth. You're right for the part, you uh, Tony. You you're right for the part." Oliver couldn't, you should have heard what he was saying about you before you came in here. He loves you, just say, you don't read. Why do they do that? Fear, we're afraid, man, actor, we're afraid of our own shadows. But like like you say, it's just it just takes a, a tiny bit of kind of respect for the situation, respect for Oliver. And awareness. A, awareness, but also just like show you're a good guy, no matter what's happened to you before 100%. and past in the career. That's what Oliver Stone probably wants to see in that moment. If he already has, has in his mind, this is the guy for the part. Look, when you come into audition, the people you're auditioning for want to cast the film. They wanna check off that problem. That problem is now, that's gone. That, the problem of uh, Robert in the third act, got him, check, let's move on. And so sometimes we come in and we impose our problems into the room and that's Pigpen hmm. and you're dead. That is so interesting because it happens in every situation in life, really. Hundred percent. So, it describe to me Elvis Dust again because I wanna I wanna write that down. So it's it's, it's a combination of uh, self esteem, self esteem, homework, yeah, being in the right place at the right time, yeah, being right for the role, and magic. Well, right for a role and magic. Let's talk about that because you've described the approach to roles in two ways. One is the Robert De Niro way, which I'll let you describe, and one is the John Malkovich way. And I didn't quite understand your descriptions. So when, when Robert De Niro was trading at his highs, let's say Raging Bull, Goodfellas, Casino, he would become the characters. He would go study with uh, somebody. He would become a boxer for three months and he would become the characters. But then I met John Malkovich through Johnny Cusack and Malkovich told us that he lets the characters become him. I didn't quite understand what that means. I think what it means is that if you have, if you're secure enough in your own level of damages and your eccentricities, that the character, you can invite the characters into you. Look, every time you play a character, it's a lie. 
It's a big fat lie. Right. You're not Dr. Cox. You're not a doctor. You didn't go to med school. You don't know squat about medicine. So how are we gonna reduce the depth of this lie in front of the camera? And the way you could either go study to be a doctor for four months so that when somebody calls action and the camera, which is an x-ray machine, it sees through all your BS. And so how are we gonna reduce this lie? So how did Oliver do it in Platoon? He had the actors come over to the Philippines for three weeks and we were in a boot camp for three weeks. Everybody lost 20 pounds and they were emaciated and tired and there was a revolution in the Philippines and you didn't have to act scared, you fucking well were. And so the camera suffers that. It sees all of that. So, so when Oliver Stone then actually shoots the movie, you're, you're not lying. You're, you're touching on those feelings that you actually experienced. 100%. And so when and that's Ma his Robert De Niro way. Yes. And what Malkovich would suggest is let Dr. Cox become you. Then the lie is even less profound. So that's what I don't understand. How, like, let's say, I don't know. I can't even think of like a character. Let's say I was playing Dr. Cox. What would that mean to me? Like, well, how would I let Dr. Cox come to me? Now I, I could imagine um, myself studying medicine for four months and then being kind of this quasi arrogant, but damaged, you know, with every now and then I'll let myself through sort of character. I can imagine pretending to be that is I imagine this Robert De Niro role. What does it mean to let that character come to me? Well, I'll, I can only put it on my own terms, but as the father of a child with special needs, my son Max was born with Down syndrome, and I, I used a lot of my exposure to the special needs community as it informed Dr. Cox. And so uh, underneath all this stuff with Cox, I, I thought fundamentally there had to be this huge absence and hurt, and there, there had to be all this inadequacy and, and, and disillusion and all the things that rate as a, as a father up front when you go to the hospital for all this Norman Rockwell version of, of bringing a sweet bundle home, but instead you're in the neonatal intensive care unit for four weeks because your son's heart is off and there might be digestive problems and he has sleep apnea and maybe uh, infantile seizures. Put that into Dr. Cox. Put that underneath everything and let him compensate for that. Let him hide all that. The camera will devour that. Mm -hmm. Now the lie is diminished to almost nothing. Now Cox is this really interesting guy with this preoccupation of medicine, but something else is going. Something else is going on. Right. We don't need to know what, but something else is going on because McGinley had the balls to bring his life and his love with him. Now we got something going on. That's so fascinating. So again, I'm always trying to understand the difference between theater acting where it's you're 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 on the stage the audience is in front of you you're you're there's no 17 shots there's right now as opposed to tv acting where uh if you don't get it right the first 50 times is the 51st shot there's no difference no difference no i tell all the actors on stan stan against evil which is our show on ifc um because we're going to shoot eight episodes in four weeks and four days Please, when Dana Gould, who is the creator of Stan, when he sends you the eight scripts, rehearse it like a play because we're going to shoot it completely out of sequence and some interiors. So when James and John are at, at the uh, recording the podcast and there's a scene of James and John recording the podcast in the first episode, the fifth episode and the eighth episode, we're shooting all those this morning. So you, James, have to know that uh, when your cousin died between episodes one, your character's cousins died between episodes one and four, that's going to inform the way you shoot the fourth episode. But we're doing it all this morning. So you damn sure have better done your homework and rehearse this like a play so that you know what the arc mm. of this room is gonna present. Mm. And if the actors do that, and they have, it largely mitigates an enormous number of variables that can go wrong. Now we may lose lights and stuff like that, but that's not the actor's responsibility. Mm -hmm. If you rehearse it like a play and you know the arc uh, of the whole season, we have a chance. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's preposterous to shoot eight episodes in four weeks and four days, but that's what we do. 
And so, so when you um, rehearse and uh, and like when you uh, before you audition for Scrubs, uh, even though it would seem like almost like a no brainer part to get for you, uh, I I remember reading you you had uh, you, you you put a, a a video you videotaped yourself in your basement. You just did the role over and over and over again. What are you seeing between one take of yourself and the next that you're correcting? Bad habits. Mm-hmm. Like what's a bad habit? Repeating lines for effect. Mm. Sometimes actors add ums, you know, I mean, and uh. And it's not in the script. Say what's on the page. And as the text starts to wash over you and it becomes more available, the actual words, you stop with the, you know, I mean, uh. And all of a sudden it becomes more mammoth-esque and it, it becomes more streamlined. And that's no writer wants you to add uh, vamping to their text. No one, right? So, and speaking of that, you're, people you're, think it's naturalistic. It's not. R- write, read what's on the page. Right. So, so, uh, and and of course, you've done theater. You've done Glenn Gary, Glenn Ross by Mamet. You, you've, you've, uh, you're, you're, you're the the John Patrick Shanley um, play that you did is kind of what launched you into. Film when you were saw, seen by a casting director, uh, clearly you wanted to do film and TV. There, there was more money there. I don't know if the roles were, were more or less challenging. You also loved the theater. Uh, what was what was the first time you said to yourself, "Okay, I'm, I'm I've done the work. I'm at that skill level. I'm going to start to get my my break." Well, for Platoon, we got scale plus ten. Um, which means about eleven hundred dollars uh, is your check plus ten is the ten percent to your agent. So they would get a uh, hundred, so rich, one hundred and ten dollars. <laughs> no, we were all broke when we got back. No, I was kidding. Yeah, and so I was there for four months because I don't die, <laughs> and uh, a couple of us there were there for the whole time. And by the time we got back, we were broke, and so I left. I was doing another world out in Brooklyn. And the funniest part about doing Another World, which is a daytime soap out in Brooklyn, is that they would send a teamster to pick you up and you'd go out to Cosby was shot on one set and then Another World was on the the other side. And a teamster would come and pick you up and I lived in a funeral parlor down on Sullivan Street uh, where LaGuardia was born, right next to where the Fantastics was for 32 years and the Nochironi funeral parlor. And so a teamster would come pick me up at the funeral parlor and then take me out to Brooklyn and then you'd shoot some astronomical number of pages in one day, and then you were given a subway token to get home, which I always thought was genius. We'll we'll pick you up when we need you, and here's your hey, subway token, McGinley. If you're if you're burned out now, <laughs> just see you later. See you later. Yeah. And so that, doing coming home to uh, from the Philippines to a job out in Brooklyn was pretty great, and then Oliver invited me to do Wall Street, and things kind of flowed pretty well from there. Yeah, because I feel. I feel Wall Street. You really stood out. You're like Charlie Sheen's, not quite his conscience. That's not. That's a bad way to describe it because you weren't. But you were sort of again like that. You were like between mentor, conscience, alter ego on the floor. You you were. You, he was trying to prove himself to you to some extent in in the movie. He, there was. I don't. I don't know. There's like an alter ego type of role you were playing there, and I and I feel you really stood out there, and what, you were funny. What was really interesting was letting, for the first time, being the comic relief. Um, there's not that much that's funny in Wall Street, but Oliver let me be ostensibly the comic relief in that. And the irony of that is that both Oliver's father worked down at Wall Street, and my father uh, worked down at Wall Street for. 50 plus years huh, I and i worked down on wall street for henderson brothers independent of wall street in between uh, undergrad and grad because in my family the the kind of irish sensibilities were uh how do you know you don't want to be a businessman unless you try which is so warped but i was like okay and so I was an assistant to a specialist. I was writing tickets down uh, and getting people coffee down on the floor uh, for almost six months. And after it, I said, I don't want to do this. And uh, that was good enough for the family. They were, that was, I had fulfilled my end, my, the expectation. And my father paid for grad school. And so uh, he put his money where his mouth was. 
Let's stop to take a quick break. We'll be right back. What if hiring could be easier, more streamlined, and less time consuming? So even when you're busy, you could still be smart about the way you hire. With ZipRecruiter, you could post your job to over 100 of the web's leading job boards with just one click. Then ZipRecruiter puts its smart matching technology to work, actively notifying qualified candidates about your job within minutes of posting, so you receive the best possible matches. That's why ZipRecruiter is different. Unlike other hiring sites, ZipRecruiter doesn't depend on the right candidates finding you. It finds them. No wonder 80% of employers who post on ZipRecruiter get a quality candidate through the site in just one day. No juggling emails or calls to your office. Simply screen, rate, and manage candidates all in one place with ZipRecruiter's easy-to-use dashboard. ZipRecruiter, the smartest way to hire. Find out today why ZipRecruiter has been used by businesses of all sizes and industries to find the most qualified job candidates with immediate results. And right now, my listeners can post jobs on ZipRecruiter for free. That's right, free. Just go to ZipRecruiter.com slash James. That's ZipRecruiter.com slash James. One more time to try it for free, go to ZipRecruiter.com slash James. Casper is a sleep brand that continues to revolutionize its line of products to create an exceptionally comfortable sleep experience one night at a time. With three mattress models, the original Casper, the Wave, and the Essential, Casper mattresses are perfectly designed to soothe and cradle your natural geometry. Not to mention, the breathable design helps you sleep cool and regulates your body temperature throughout the night. And it's delivered right to your door in a small, how do they do that, size box with free shipping and returns in the U.S. and Canada. But the best part is that you can be sure of your purchase with Casper's 100-night risk-free sleep on a trial. After all, you spend one-third of your life sleeping, so you should be comfortable. I do have to say, people literally stop me on the street, and not only do they say, James, I love your podcast, but they say, I actually have a Casper mattress It's the best mattress I've ever slept on. So I'm grateful for all the listeners who've actually been buying their Casper mattresses and telling me how it is. I always say how important sleep is, and I'm hoping you're nodding your head yes right now because really, you can't be healthy without good sleep. At least I know I can't be healthy without good sleep. I've actually stopped switching homes because I want to stay in one place with my Casper. It's the best investment I can make for myself, my health, and my creativity. Start sleeping ahead of the curve with Casper. Get $50 towards any mattress purchase by visiting casper.com slash James and using James at checkout. That's casper.com slash James, offer code James, for $50 off your mattress purchase. Terms and conditions apply. So then becoming comic relief on the movie Wall Street, I kind of, I feel like, you know, you've you've been doing almost comic relief ever since. Uh, I mean, Scrubs. You're obviously a very serious character, but it was an extremely funny show. And you're the um, the straight guy for JD in in some sense. Like you were a comedian, and uh, uh, you know, I I feel like you're a very comedic actor. Was that surprising to you? No, because it felt like a niche that I could occupy without being nailed down, because that. That character is is in the landscape of almost every single format. There there has to be at some point we got to laugh uh, in most things. Like even in Seven, when when we're looking at the the skinny guy, and then he comes to life, and I do this huge jump backwards. I mean, it's kind of absurd that this big butch SWAT guy, you know, with the, with his uh, Beretta uh, shotgun comes in, and they're all. They're all butch, and then he gets really close next to that that guy who's being starved to death, and then he awakes, and I'll go third person, but McGinley does this crazy ejection back across the room, and Fincher thought it was the funniest thing he ever saw, so he kept it. And uh, uh, you don't think of much comedy in Seven. Yeah, no, it's a horrific kind of movie. And what about Stand Against Evil? I mean, it's sort of a, a, an absurdist premise in Stand Against Evil, and you're playing a very damaged 
character. But again, the, the damaged character versus the absurdism allows you to, to be comic. I thought when I was first sent Stand Against Evil by Dana Gould, who ran the writer's room. And by the way, he's a, a stand-up comedian from way back. Yeah, and he's genius. Yeah. And he ran the writer's room in The Simpsons, which is kind of top of the food chain of writer's rooms. Like Scrubs was right up there. But I think as I was mentioning to you, writer's rooms are populated by these super bright, driven people, all of whom were the intellectual uh, heads of their class and journalistically, they ran the lampoon at Harvard, all of them. Uh, they ran the social media stuff at Stanford and now they're Hollywood writers. And so uh, on Scrubs, we had two rooms of seven and they would leapfrog every episode. And then the Norman Lear-esque character, in our case, Bill Lawrence on Scrubs was kind of the minstrel who would who would polish what they wrote on on Stand Against Evil, it's a guy named Dana Gould who ran the writer's room on The Simpsons for eight years, which is an impossibly amazing achievement. And the whole time he was in the writer's room of The Simpsons, in the back of his mind, he's thinking, he told me this, he's thinking, I got one I'd like to do. I'd like to, I'd like to, com I'd like to do a horror comedy. I'd like to do a horror movie trapped in a sitcom. And that was Stand Against Evil. And so when he sent it to me, unbeknownst to him, uh, what he'd put on the page, and great writers do this, was this really damaged guy. And we find out in the pilot of Stand Against Evil that the two things he has in his life are his job. He's been a sheriff in this mythical New England town, New Hampshire town, for 27 years. And he's been married to the same woman for 27 years. And the first 30, 30 seconds of the pilot, those two things are taken from him. And that's what I connected to, that sense of loss and, and damage. And what's this guy supposed to do now? And that's what, I said that to Dana. I said, well, that's the stuff you have to investigate. Otherwise, I don't, I don't, cause he's kind of an equal opportunity offender like Carol O'Connor in, in Archie, in, in, in uh, All in the Family. But, 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 and sorry to interrupt, an equal opportunity offender like Carol O'Connor, um, who also has kind of every now and then you see this heart of gold, but uh, you always touch that vein of okay. At some point, there was there was some love in this character. There was there was something meaningful that he that he hung on to, and now he's he, he, you know it's kind of his quest to, to find that again. Yes, or to 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 reconcile that he's not going to find it again. Mm -hmm. And so now what? Where are we going? What are we doing? And where's your mind when you're playing that? When you're saying the words. I, I like, I, my whole thing is about constructing, constructing verbs as they apply to what we're doing. I always ask actors, what are you doing? And don't use the word try. What are you doing? And so in other words, when, when Stan is watching TV and having some beers, are you escaping? Are you... Uh, flourishing? Are you hiding? What are you doing? What are you doing? Can they do something relative to themselves or does it, or do they do it relative to the people around them? The first thing you have to do is serve the script. Mm. And so nothing else matters except for the what's on the page. What are you doing? So in other words, when you're getting off the bus in that scene where you get off the bus, where you left the bomb, are you escaping? Are you detonating it? When you, do you have a, a trigger? What are you doing? What's the verb? and the verbs liberate actors. And so as soon as you can identify aggressive verbs that move you through the script, uh, you have a chance. And I'm obsessed with verbs. So tell me a situation like either on Scrubs or Stand Against Evil or Wall Street or Platoon where verbs is what got you into doing something as opposed to just uh, maybe not acting as well as you could be. Well, I'm not quite sure about the end of that question, but I can tell you at the end of Platoon, uh, when when O'Neill comes out of that foxhole and and he's he's covered himself with a body overnight to get through the last uh, when the, when the Viet Cong overrun uh, their position, and and O'Neill takes a dead body and covers himself with it, and then the next day uh, the the Americans are coming and cleaning up all the dead. And O'Neill comes up from out of the foxhole, and uh, the guy asks him, "Are are you okay?" And and he says, "The effing idiots! They they all left me here, and and I'm crying, and that's all a lie." 
So the verb is to lie hmm. and to cover hmm. and to protect yourself because that's all a lie. He was a coward. He did a cowardly thing, but he survived. And then when I told vets, uh, the vets who watched the movie, one guy took me aside and said he did that. He was weeping, weeping. We were down in Washington, D.C. And uh, I was overwhelmed. He said, I did that. So you're thinking when you're coming out of that foxhole, you're thinking to yourself, okay, how do I lie here? How do I? No, no. just lie. Just lie. Don't worry about how. It'll, mm. it'll, when someone calls action, if you serve the verb, if you lie. I like this phrase, serve the verb, and I'm trying to, I'm trying to understand completely what it means. Uh, uh, what's the difference between lying right there and figuring out how to lie right there? Like when you, when you, you know, what's figuring? Figuring's not an aggressive enough verb. Hmm. That's that's clutter. Hmm. Lie, just lie, just lie. Or or to serve the lie, uh, pretend. Do what you did when you were a kid coming home from fourth grade with your report card that you didn't want your father to see, and you had to and you had to put his signature on because you, if you showed that report card, you get a you get an ass whooping. So you signed your report card for your father, which is a lie. What were you doing? You were covering. You were you were cowering. You were you were surviving. That's a better verb. Survive. Huh. That survival informed the lie. You so, made it. You made it through. You're the only guy who made it through that night. Everybody else got killed. In the context of the movie, right? So call so, action, man. Yeah. So it's interesting because what would happen? What would it look like if it wasn't powerful enough? If you weren't totally serving the lie? It's, the camera would suffer it as bullshit. And the audience would be able to tell. Yes. Mm. And that's when bad, that's when things that you and I watch, we're like, oh, wasn't that great? That's why probably, mo I mean, right now with this, I mean, there's everybody's doing original programming. There's uh, literally like hundreds and hundreds of new shows now every year because of Netflix, Amazon, Hulu, plus every cable channel. And now channels. there's going to be more because Apple's going to start generating content. Yeah, Apple, I mean, everybody's going to start generating content. Like, just websites with an audience I guess will start right. generating content. A audience is going to turn into content, and so, and so there's going to be lots of bad shows and lots of bad actors who haven't had the training, who maybe didn't think they needed the training. And where do you see this going? Where do, where is television heading? I mean, right now, I can't even think of shows that last more than two or three seasons, really, that that, that have started recently. Well, maybe shows aren't supposed to last more than two or three seasons. Hmm. I don't know. Maybe that's a dinosaur. Scrubs was nine years and almost two hundred episodes. Maybe that's too much. And and I feel Scrubs was around during this real golden age of television, where it was kind of the, it was really the first time there were these big massive arcs that uh, were often very beautiful and artistic. And you know, I mean, writing is still. I feel the, the best writers are moving into the television, but I don't know something something about two thousand to twenty ten. I can't think of any of my absolute all-time favorite shows that started after 2010. And, Game, of, Game of Thrones? Uh, I, I don't watch Game of Thrones. It's, I haven't, for, for whatever reason, everybody loves it and I, and I respect that everyone loves it. Kevin's, I, Kevin's show down in Washington? Yeah, uh, House of Cards, I would say, is like the only one. Pretty great. Uh, well, what's interesting, what's happened on the landscape of television also is the new normal is eight episodes. Yeah. It's not, we used to do 24 on on scrubs that's too many 24 and you'd have to have enough too many. you'd have to have enough depth in the characters and in the story to last 100 episodes from from episode 1 you'd have to be able to ask how does this last 100 episodes and now you, i don't think you have to ask that question anymore stan we do 8 uh game of thrones they do 8 kevin show they do 8 uh that's the new normal maybe that's good i just watched ozark which was really good oh, i haven't uh, seen it. i'll watch that bateman show which is really good and it's 8 or 10 that's the new normal. Maybe that's good. Maybe that storytelling is more efficient. Right, because I guess it's somewhere in between the long form of a movie. Like it's making a, a movie longer form, but shorter form than a TV show that lasts forever. Because no story lasts forever, really. Right. It's just, that's not possible. Like All in the Family, um, you know, just going back to Norman Lear, that could potentially have lasted forever. It had that kind of format where... Yeah, it spun, as long off, as the characters it spun were off Archie's place. yeah. It wasn't and the Jeffersons and the Jeffersons, right? Yeah, you're right. And so that was a that was pretty rich. That soil was rich for storytelling. 
And I, I don't feel, I mean, potentially Scrubs could have done that. Like, you know, JD could be could be the Dr. Cox of some new hospital in Scrubs. You know, potentially those shows could have, you, you could have had that that spinoff type effect, but spinoffs don't really happen any either. I guess Frasier would be the only yeah. kind of anomaly there. But that's in the 90s even. Yeah. Stan, with Stan, there's already a finite number of things we can do because there's a finite number of witches that are trying to kill me. And so once we make it through those witches at 80 year, um, we'll be good. <laughs> we'll be fine. Right. And then, and then just on to the next, on to the next one. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's, it's Stan is still so fresh and, and subversive. And the hero is such an anti hero. He's this guy. I think I was telling you that he just, wants to resolve the conflict so he doesn't have to hear about it. He doesn't want to do it heroically. He doesn't, Stan doesn't want to be anyone's uh, father figure or mentor or, or, or anything. He just doesn't want to be bothered. And that's interesting to see your hero resolving conflict because that's what's motivating him. It's great. So when you said the word bother just now, I hear Stan. <laughs> so like that's the I guess what you mean by saying the character is coming to you. Uh yes. you're yourself still, you're bothered, and that's the character coming out. Exactly. It takes some spine. Mm -hmm. It takes some it takes a set because the assumption is that you, James, are interesting enough to allow this entity that somebody wrote into your world and that's gonna be interesting enough. James's college of eccentricities and values and sensibilities is gonna be interesting enough to let this character piggyback on you. That takes some spine. And that's what I think Malkovich was telling us. That takes courage. So I wonder like, how do you, I mean, obviously you developed that skill really well. It, it, it seems like a very difficult skill. So yeah, and there, as a result, there's some things I'm not right for. Because because McGinley's coming kit and caboodle with this thing, and so uh, I haven't done it in a long time. But when I did, I sounded arrogant. When I used to audition, I would bring all my SHIT with me because if you and I are going to relocate down to Buenos Aires and shoot this thing, um, I want to show you what I'm coming because we're going to stop our lives for four months and go down to Buenos Aires hypothetically, and shoot this thing. And if I get down there and all of a sudden I show you the stuff that I brought and you're like, oh, no, no, don't, 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 don't do that. Mm -hmm. I'm like, yeah, that's what I do. And so I used to bring into auditions and sometimes- So I was, guess there's a certain honesty, a certain authenticity. You're, absolutely. You're, you're not gonna wanna pretend to be ready for a role that you're not ready for. <laughs> so maybe I don't wanna play your way. If if you don't want to meet me at the fifty yard line, I don't want to do it. I don't. So why do you think a lot of actors don't have this level? And maybe I shouldn't say it that way, but it feels like because there are so many opportunities out there now, there's a lot of ways to escape super professionalism as opposed to being grounded in a in a foundation of skills. You know, you've already talked about many skills that are required to be a, an actor, and, and and it strikes me as extremely difficult. But I feel like a lot of people get away with not developing those skills. And that's okay. Uh, I, I always think, like I told you, I think the camera is an x-ray machine and and you'll be exposed pretty quickly. When I asked Pacino, the uh, first time I met Al was on Any Given Sunday, Oliver's football movie. And then we would subsequently, uh, we would do Glen Gary on uh, Broadway together with Bobby Cannavale and Richard Schiff and this bulletproof uh, bulletproof ensemble. Uh, amazing actors, amazing oh. writers. How, uh, you know, that was just, the greatest experience of my life. Just, just to go on a tangent, Emma, like what are what are you thinking when you're standing there and it's like you're standing right in the middle of one of the greatest pieces of work of of art with with the greatest actors no on the planet? It was the it was the greatest experience of my life. A, a, a children aside and and family aside, it was everything you know. Eighty films and two hundred episodes of Scrubs and uh, and daytime and going to the Philippines. It all added up to being able to go to the Schoenfeld for a hundred performances and doing that play with Al and Bobby and Richard and uh, I, I get chills thinking about it. It was astonishing. What it was would a you rock see? Rock and roll show. What would you see in Al Pacino's acting that was really above and beyond? What would you learn from him? 
Well, certainly on any given Sunday, uh, Al and Paul Newman on uh, Fat Man and Little Boy about the atomic bombs in Los Alamos. Let's just throw in Paul Newman in here. <laughs> Did I drop that? I'm sorry, James. <laughs> Let me pick that up. <laughs> That's okay. They, they both uh, know lenses. So in other words, they know how big or small to be according to how far away the shot is. So if it's a if it's a full length shot, they might have to gesticulate anymore, as opposed to when it when it comes in, they call it the money. When it comes in for the tight shot, stuff's going to get a little quieter, and yeah. Paul's going to start being down in here, yeah. and Al might be just right in here, and it just it might be a little quieter. And the way they they meter that uh, with the lenses that was the first thing I noticed with Newman, and then with Al, Al's complete. Uh, availability to just being present and letting the camera, not doing a monkey show to to be interesting or some strange thing that we do when we overact. Al's fine just to let the camera come and find him. Uh, I think, you know, and it might be a cliche to bring up Godfather 1, but, but I think it's his silences that bring the ca character 100%. in in that. And I he mean, did the same thing in any given in. Sunday with all these massive men walking around in this epic gladiator story. And, uh, and Oliver was telling this wildly crazy layered story about conflict and men and all these insane metaphors. And I was just fine uh, being here and letting the camera come to him. Is that like a confidence that he had just it, preternaturally or is he, did he develop it? He's a magician. He's a magician. I asked him. I asked him down in Miami. I said, "Why'd you, why'd you, why'd you want to be an actor in the first place?" And I'll never forget it because it was good enough for him. It was good enough for me. And he goes, "John, see, I just want to be a storyteller." And uh, uh, same here. I just want to be a storyteller. And and you know you you mentioned the word magic again, and you mentioned the word magic and that Elvis dust, uh, and that's the one word I didn't get to yet, which is what is that magic? I don't know. It's a, sometimes it doesn't show up. I think like I, when you're reading, when you're a reader, and someone comes in and they've got that confidence, they've they've, they've done their homework. They're a good guy. Uh, they're at the right place at the right time. Like the role needs, you know, let's say this demographic. What's that extra magic? I, I don't know because when you try to self generate it, it it invariably comes off as arrogant. When I went into audition for seven. Uh, I went in to meet David Fincher and the producer, Arnold Copelson, who had also produced Platoon. So that was the connective tissue. I went in to read for a Latin, the cop, California, the head of the SWAT team, was named California. And he was written as a Latin guy. But Arnold wanted me to come in and meet David Fincher. And that felt really good. That that stamp of validation that Arnold Copelson gave me, because he was in the Philippines with us for four months, he was not a sitting on the sidelines producer. Arnold was right there, one of the great producers of all time. And Arnold Copelson giving my Irish ass the stamp of validation that I should come in and meet David, even though I'm not right for it. I, I felt like I wanted to eat nails and I had Elvis dust all over me, hmm. all over me. I would have run through that glass window if he asked me to, I didn't care. And 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 was it? Um, and I had nothing rehearsing? to do with it. Was it? It was nothing to do with it. It just was the. I just felt powerful. Why? Just try to think. Why did you feel that right then? Because that's Cause we, somebody, all want, we somebody, all want that Elvis stuff. Somebody who I respect, uh, and, and and actors. You know, we we're scared of a lot of things, and it's a really ephemeral way to make a living. And you never know if the whole thing is going to go away in a second. And for Arnold Colpison, this giant in Hollywood at the time, uh, for him to, to, to permit me to, to be this full, uh, felt like a license to flourish. And those don't come along. And so, so, you know, I feel like in, in Scrubs also on a TV sense, you had this license to flourish. I mean, that was such a ca iconic character that lasted for so many years. I mean, it's a classic, it's one of the best classic sitcoms ever. There may never, there never may, may be a time in TV history where we get a chance to do a show like that again. It was you, Zach Braff, everybody in the cast was funny. When did you start? When did you, you you start filming that? When did you say to yourself, "Oh my gosh, Zach Braff uh, is going to be this amazing comedic talent 
the writers are doing something unbelievable. I mean, it's this one camera shot sitcom. I don't know of any sitcom shot that way. Uh, it's it was like a work. It also was a work of art. And when did you say to yourself, "This is something special"? As soon as I figured that, the more I brought Max, my son Max, with me, it it in, it gave me all this power that had nothing to do with Scrubs. It just gave me power, right? Because you knew you were doing the right thing. I I knew I knew what love was, and Cox is full of love that he can't express. And I had to bring Max's love with me. And that power, maybe some people feel that way about their God or their significant other. I felt that way about my son. And as soon as I, I, I brought Max with me early and it liberated everything, everything. And then, and then with that and with that idea, now you're seeing JD and Zach Braff playing JD. When did you see, okay, this guy is comedy? Zach Braff is his generation's skill wise, John Ritter. He's massively skilled. Not only as a film director and and now he'll be a TV he's a TV producer this fall, but his his comic chops and his skill levels, and this is pretty much as big a compliment as I can give you, are right up there with John Ritter's, who, ironically, Billy would then bring on as Zach's father. And he was gonna come back, the week he was gonna come back for another episode. Uh, John passed, mm-hmm. but uh, I I think, and it was became clear to me early on that straight up skill level, Zach was right up there with John Ritter. And what are those skills? Timing, sensibilities, drive, uh, awareness. Is it certain Cere- physical? Cerebral, cerebrally, Zach is really smart and he's very nimble. And that way, then you have to be. We're shooting eight pages a day. We're shooting 16 hours a day. Mm. We spend more time with each other just by virtue of the finite number of hours in a day. For eight years, nine years, nine years, we spent more time with each other than we did our families. Mm. Much more, much more. Because Friday, you were behind. So there was a, a laundry list of shots you'd have to get to into Saturday morning. So now it's 4 a.m. Saturday morning. And you're wrapped. Now you're gonna go home, you're gonna sleep till 12 or one or two, get up, work out, have dinner with your wife, see the kids. And then Sunday, you're studying Monday stuff. You know, it seems a lot, a lot of- And I'm not complaining, by the way, I like to grind. Oh, I, I, look, you know, Warren Buffett says he never has a day of work. He's, he's skipping to work, you know, it's, he's skipping to what he loves every day. So if you love what you do, you never have a day of work. Yeah, I buy that. And uh, it seems part of loving what you work, do, and that includes the character you're playing, is having this overriding vision of what you're doing. If you can't bring that vision to the table, you're, you, it's like you say the camera's gonna see it. So you have to kind of infuse yourself with that vision, and then you don't have to worry. You're gonna show up, for, you're, you're gonna rehearse, you're gonna memorize your lines, you're gonna show up for the audition, you're gonna play the role, but that vision's gonna inform everything you do. What, does that sound like it makes sense for, for acting? 100%, but that's also, that every time you have to scale that mountain, it's a lot of work, and it could arguably be a pain in the tail. In, unless that turns you on, unless that's a great New York Times crossword puzzle of a problem that is so delicious to solve. All those things you just said could be burdensome to people. If you got lead in the ass, if you're a little lazy, um, you're not gonna do it. Right, so how, what gave you that extra discipline? I don't know, some kind of Irish work ethic passed down by my father, I don't know. So there's, there's discipline, there's learning all the skills, there's having the ability to come up with his vision and let the character infuse itself or himself into you. Um, uh, there's- But like I just, programmed, I just programmed two hours on E Street Radio, which is something on Sirius. Mm-hmm. And uh, because I'm so obsessed with Bruce and I had done it before, um, I've spent last two weeks obsessing over those two hours of programming. And it was as a result of all the work I did, and I and I pulled different passages from Born to Run, which is an autobiography, uh, and I and I applied it to what I was doing, and that made it fun for me. But I had to obsess out on. I had to deconstruct the whole 120 minutes, 
And then I had to micromanage it. And then by the time I got there this morning, I could just let it go. I was mm. good. I was completely unburdened by the whole thing and it, and it flowed. You know, when you get with a shrink, a lot of times, if you have a good shrink, you talk about what, what components are, are we gonna have to organize to get you into a flow state. Athletes talk about it. Actors sometimes get in a state of flow. And I was, I was just flowing this morning. And if you can get into a flow state, uh, that's nirvana. And, and I think the flow state comes a little bit, not a little bit, but a lot from over-delivering. Over-delivering on the research, over-delivering on agree more. the skills. Uh, because then when you're there, you're able to go above and beyond you, you, your brain can shut off, and you do, it and the love kicks in, and I, and I think that 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 shows in in good acting. I don't I don't know. I've never acted. I agree because when all when all the homework and all that stuff, and you don't put it up on a billboard. Billboard. When somebody calls action, you just throw it out, and it's a shrug. Yeah, and then that's magic. And so so, how's Max doing? Max is twenty years old. He is, thank you for asking. He got his first job at Starbucks a couple of months ago. And this, his job at Starbucks came after uh, Nicole, my wife and I were saying, look, Max graduated from Santa Monica High School a year or so ago. And his skill sets were largely lending themselves to him leading a life of leisure. Uh, in other words, he likes to be on the beach. He likes to play games on the computer, Mario, Luigi, likes to do Star Wars, likes to play his guitar and hang out with chicks and his sisters. And we're like, well, if that, then he he landed in the right family, fine. Cause he's not gonna, he, some of our special needs community stacks boxes at Walmart or helps bag at the grocery store. That's not where Max was. And so if he was gonna hang out on the beach for the next couple of years, then fine. And bang, he gets a job at Starbucks. And the funniest thing about the job at Starbucks is that we've spent thousands and thousands of dollars on, on his speech. That's been our biggest, on his verbal capacity to communicate. Not in, in gestures, but encouraging and fostering spoken language. And at Starbucks, he only talks to people in Spanish. Really? Even... <laughs> In Hola, senor, <laughs> como esta? <laughs> what, it, what did you just say? Is he doing that as a joke? No. He says, Maybe oh, he's, senorita bonita. And I'm like, what, what is he saying? Is he, you think it's a little bit of nervousness? So he wants to no, play with the... He just likes the sound. Huh. And he's heard enough uh, Spanish sound or Latin sound at Santa Monica and from Maria who works with us that he is now perfectly comfortable um, saying, hola, senor, como esta? Ah, bien, muy bien. And you're like, what, 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 wait, 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 what? It's the greatest hey, thing ever. If that's, if that's how that role has infused itself in him, then he's it's up good. And it's good. Well, John McGinley, it's such an honor to have you here. I've been such a fan for like, I guess over 20 years or right around 20 years. Cause I guess I first saw you probably in Platoon and then um, Wall Street. Yeah, 30 years. Uh, my math is bad. Uh, and then of course, Scrubs, you play. Oh, and then Office Space. We didn't mention that where you're hugely funny. And uh, I don't even know that's a phrase, but, uh, and then of course, Scrubs for, for nine years, uh, now Stand Against Evil. Uh, I, I'm always trying to learn what it takes to achieve such peak performance in life. Someone listening to this who's maybe struggling with what should I do next or I feel like I'm in a rut, what would just be, and, and they don't even know what they want to do, but what would be, just to close, what would be, and I know I'm asking you this out of nothing, but what would be one piece of advice you would give that person listening to this? The one piece of advice I, I, I could give to 20 two-year-old John McGinley getting out of NYU full of fear and, and Irish willfulness and entitlement, I would just go, hey, John, it's going to be okay. That's what I would tell that kid. But that's because you could say it in retrospect. And that 22-year-old kid wouldn't have believed that's what you. I would have told, that's what I would tell him, that stuff's largely going to be okay, unless you have health issues, of which we've dealt with. But unless you have health issues, it's, it's going to be okay. Stuff's largely going to be okay. That's a fact. And 
I think you're right, and I think that's good advice. I'm going to extrapolate a little from this interview, which is to say, number two, assuming that everything's going to be okay, don't be afraid to always over deliver on the things you love. Yeah, but it sounds like what that's what you've done with each role. So, John McGinley, once again, thanks so much for coming on the podcast. Thanks, James. It's been a pleasure. Yeah, thank you. Next time on the James Altucher Show. One of the things I learned about what makes news and what makes people care is that if you're doing something really well, there's no news story there. But if you do it a different way, that immediately gets people's attention. And they say, oh, a new thing. Finally, there's a new thing. Let's talk about the new thing. I mean, look how hard it is to change fields. And so, so dramatically. The hardest sell is how do you convince somebody that you're not what you've been for you know, decades or that you have more to offer. So I came in through sort of the side entrance. Which I think is a very good technique. I think people underestimate the back door or the side entrance. AI might be the most important new computer technology ever. It's storming every industry, and literally billions of dollars are being invested. So buckle up. The problem is that AI needs a lot of speed and processing power, so how do you compete without costs spiraling out of control? It's time to upgrade to the next generation of the cloud, Oracle Cloud Infrastructure, or OCI. OCI is a single platform for your infrastructure, database, application development, and AI needs. OCI has four to eight times the bandwidth of other clouds, offers one consistent price instead of variable regional pricing, and of course, nobody does data better than Oracle. So now you can train your AI models at twice the speed and less than half the cost of other clouds. If you want to do more and spend less, like Uber, 8x8, and Databricks Mosaic, take a free test drive of OCI at oracle.com slash advance. That's oracle.com slash advance. oracle.com slash advance.